these lecture slides can serve as kind of a reference uh, when you're getting things set up. Unfortunately, there's a lot of steps here. So um, it may seem a little gratuitous. Obviously, you get used to it the more you do it, but there are it gets a little complicated, so, so bear with me. So first of all, um, in case you haven't, in case you're not in 313 and you have, haven't taken 611, uh, an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. It's a chip that's basically a blank slate. Uh, it's a useless when you power it on, it does nothing. It's basically a paperweight until you configure it. So you electronically configure it to act as a arbitrary digital logic circuit, right? So you Basically, you do, do a hardware design, and then you put it on the FPGA, and the FPGA takes on the behavior of that logic circuit. Uh, FPGAs store that information in a volatile way, though, so if you power off the FPGA, the configuration is lost. Um, if you look inside your, your car, for instance, it probably has 40-some FPGAs in it. Obviously, you power your car off, so how does that work? Well, each FPGA, generally, when, it, when they're deployed in, in a a system, they have a, uh, a non-volatile RAM that's used to configure them when you power them up. Um, uh, and in fact, the board, these boards that we're using in class do exactly that because when you first power it up, it, it configures the FPGA uh, from uh, a configuration stored in SRAM, and that's why it's blinking like this. All of this behavior going on right now is actually being driven by the FPGA, and it was configured from uh, a non-volatile RAM that's not on the chip, it's on the board, but it's still configures the FPGA. Now you can change that by the way. You can reprogram that chip on here if you want this thing to do something else when you power it on. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, uh, so basically FPGAs allow you to do hardware design, with, hardware design without having to fabricate a chip, which takes a long time and is very expensive, as, as you might imagine. Uh, the downside is that you get 10 times less transistors or 10 times less gates than you would if you fabbed a chip, and the clock runs 10 times slower. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the disadvantage. Uh, but if you fab a chip, it you know costs millions of dollars and takes a long time to get it back, and it's very hard to test. And then, generally speaking, the first version of it will never work. I've designed uh, I don't know seven or eight chips in my life, and none of them worked. <laughs> we taped them out; they came back. None of them worked. Yes. Yeah, so the difference is between, an F the distinction I'm making is between uh, an FPGA and a ASIC, which is an, a uh, an application-specific integrated circuit. An ASIC is uh, fabricated through um, applying masks to a silicon wafer in, in a fab. And so, you know, you, everyone, I'm sure all of you heard about the chip shortage right now. Um, the chip shortage is going on because these fabs, you know, they require a lot of, a lot of raw materials, mostly are... Uh, nasty chemicals they use to make these chips and of course with the supply chain being screwed up they're not able to get those uh, supplies and thus they're not able to make chips. Um, you need uh, lots of different types of nasty acids called piranha acid which is the nastiest kind of acid there is uh, and lots of uh, hydrochloric acid and photoresist and lots of stuff not to mention silicon ingots. Um, pure silicon ingots, not the silicon dioxide you find on the beach or near your windows, but pure silicon crystals, which are very difficult to manufacture because um, they have to be grown. So um, that's, that's what the chip shortage is all about, but those are for A6. These are FPGAs that have been prefabricated, but they can, be, they can mimic uh, an ASIC essentially, but they run slower. Uh, so yeah, so that's an FPGA. And so we're using these FPGA boards. So an FPGA by itself is useless, even if you can configure it, because it has to be connected to stuff. It has to be wired into peripherals. And so the reason we chose this board is because it's got a ton of peripherals, and it's almost indestructible. So um, as opposed to like the Atmel uh, chips that we used two years ago in this class that are very destructible, these are indestructible, essentially. Um, so the idea is they have uh, the FPGA kind of in the middle, and then they got a gazillion components on, on the board. Uh, and that's also why these are so expensive, is because you know, there, there's a lot of, as you might imagine, a lot of effort required to solder all these components on. But we've got uh, seven segment displays, LCD switches, buttons. There's like four or five different kinds of memories on this thing. There's all, all kinds of ports. 
Uh, there's several analog to digital converters. There's several di different types of USB. There's video. There's sound. There's infrared. There's high speed serial. There's SMA connectors for high speed clocks. There's LEDs, um, SD card, tons and tons of stuff. Network, dual gigabit Ethernet networking. So it has a lot of stuff on it. And so basically, if you want to use any, it's designed to be a teaching board, basically. So the idea is that you could do a lot of stuff with this. People, you know, build video games on these things or uh, robots. There's all kinds of stuff you can use. But basically, you choose which peripherals you want to use, and then you configure the FPGA to talk to those peripherals. So as you might imagine, um, whenever you use those, there's a lot of interfacing involved, and that's what this course is mainly about. Um, okay, so we're going to be using... Uh, a tool called Cordis to configure this. Now this, this FPGA was made by a company called Altera who were bought by Intel, so now they're Intel FPGAs technically. Um, although you may, see, you may still see some references to Altera, but they're, you know, that's slowly changing to in, everything to say is Intel now, generally. Uh, so uh, Cordis is the CAD tool that we're using uh, for, this, for this class. It's the same one used for 611 and 313 as well. Um, and so Cordis basically is a tool that allows you to take Verilog code and, and convert it into a form where you could program the FPGA. That's essentially what it does. Now in this class, we're going to take that a step further, like we do in 3.13. Instead of having you use Verilog directly, and we will be learning Verilog in this class, um, but initially we're going to use something called Platform Designer, which is a separate tool, although it's still kind of under the umbrella of Cordis, and it allows you to construct a platform, whereas a platform means it's got a processor, a bus, and a bunch of peripherals in a system on chip. So basically, that's the same kind of thing, the same kind of architecture you have on your phone's processor. Um, but now, because you're building this on FPGA, you can customize it for the application that you want, right? Whereas the one on your phone is an ASIC and it's fixed, right? So, uh, so that's platform designer. And then in previous uh, years, we used Eclipse to write the software for the processor that we put on the FPGA, and now we're using command line tools because they're a little bit more reliable. Uh, one thing you should understand, though, is all these tools are really flaky. Even though they've been around for a long time and they're very expensive, they're all very flaky, and I, I never have been able to figure out why that is. The rationale I've always used is that you know, they're, they're designed by engineers that aren't good programmers, basically. Um, so this isn't like using Microsoft PowerPoint. These are very flaky tools. They crash a lot, and they're not documented. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, oh, the other thing about these tools too, I'll, I'll mention real quick that you should be aware. They can be kind of slow, and the reason why they're slow is because when you actually run a compile job through these things, they use like a weird combination of natively compiled C, Java, and Perl that all work together instead of just relying on a single language. They use like a, an amalgamation of different languages that make these things work. Uh, and Tickle, which is another, another scripting language. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, okay, I already talked about that. Oh, one, one, one thing I want to mention here too is that, so, so just to give you, just to kind of explain this again and make it a bit, bit more clear. So the FPGA allows you to put any arbitrary digital logic, you know, in, into, into existence. We're, because we're using Platform Designer, we're actually creating a, what's, what's known as a soft core processor, which is a processor, it's a MIPS processor called the NEOS 2, uh, that, is, uh, that is designed in Verilog and put on the FPGA. And then you can write C code and compiled C code for that processor, right? And then if, if you want, you can also design custom hardware components as well. The code that you write on that processor is bare metal code, meaning that there's no operating system. Now, you can run an operating system on that processor, but we're not going to do it because it takes even longer to get all that set up with the bootloader and everything. So it is, in theory, possible to get Linux running on this board. We're just going to be running it in bare metal. Bare metal code means that you write code that runs directly on the CPU without an, without an operating system kind of running underneath of it. And so your code fundamentally runs in an infinite loop because if it returns, there's nothing to return to. It just crashes the system if you return from the main function. Um, however, bare metal code is a little bit of a misnomer because in reality, you still have a very thin layer of software that you can use to help. It's not just your code and your code only. There's, there's a layer of code called the hardware abstraction layer. 
and it's not an operating system per se, but it fills some of the, the uh, duties of an operating system. It provides some uh, drivers for you, basically, that we can use. Okay? All right, so that's the BSP. Now, the BSP is customized for the hardware, though. So every time you regenerate your, your hardware, you have to regenerate the BSP. The BSP is like a software layer that has to be generated specifically for your hardware setup. Does that make sense? Okay, I told you it's going to get a little, a little complicated, but once you start working with it, it'll, it'll make sense. Okay, so to launch Cordis, you just type Cordis. So I'm going to go ahead and start doing that. So um, I have a, um, hopefully you guys can see that. <clears throat> so I've got, yes? Sorry, what is the BSP? You so, said that you have to build it whenever you uh, change your hardware, and then the BSP is basically the software. So what is this in specific? The BSP is a, is a hardware abstraction layer, meaning that it'll convert and remember at the beginning of this class, we talked about how software and hardware communicate. It does it through interrupts and it does it through programmed I.O. Instead of having to use those things every single time you want to talk to a peripheral, which in some cases, if you're talking to something like a USB or an Ethernet, it would be massively complex for you to do that. So the hardware abstraction layer has some of the, like basically drivers in there. So instead of having to, to directly interact with hardware with your code, you could do it through a little bit of a, a, like a function they provide, basically. So instead of having to tell the, the UART controller, all right, UART controller, set up for 57,600 baud in one stop bit, you just say printf, and it, and it goes through it because the printf is implemented by the HAL, the hardware abstraction layer, right? So it, it simplifies things a bit. You don't have to use it. You can just write code. You can just put machine code on this thing if you want. But the hardware abstraction layer, it, it makes it a little bit like programming a real computer, but it's, you know, it, there's, no, there's no exception handling in it. So if you crash your program, it bricks the board. I mean, not permanently bricks it, but crashes the hardware and makes it useless until you reconfigure the FPGA or reload your software. Um, there's no like segmentation fault or anything like that. There's no safety net like you have in Linux. Uh, if you read address zero, it just crashes. In here, if you read address zero, the board just stops working. Yes? But it is still possible to do your own exception handling, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. You, well, yeah, yeah, yes, you, you can. Yeah, we haven't really, yeah, you can. Uh, we haven't done, the problem with the memory part that I was referring to is that you need a memory management unit to do that kind of memory checking. And the NEOS processor actually does have that as an option. We don't usually use it. We just use a physical memory space. So with physical memory, there's, it's hard to catch memory protection errors, right? Uh, you can if you turn on the MMU. We've never actually done it. Uh, you're welcome to try. <laughs> but it, normally if you have the MMU turned on, you need an operating system for that. Any kind of bare metal programming. I've never seen a bare metal environment that uses an MMU. That doesn't mean it's not been done, but I've never seen it happen. Usually it's physical memory addresses when you're doing bare metal. Okay, so, um, and by the way, BSP stands for board support package, which makes no sense to me at all because it's really a hardware abstraction layer. I don't know where the board support package comes from because it's not even supporting a board. It's supporting the hardware and the platform that you design. So that makes no sense. So I just, I still call it the BSP, but the, the acronym doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so you launch Cordis, which is Cordis. Um, you're going to get this window. Um, and again, some of you, this might be old news for any of you that have taken a course with these boards already. I'll try to get through this as quick as I can. I'm also going to try to follow the slides too. So um, when you do this, you can go back and refer to these as well. Okay, so, all right. So the first thing you want to do is create a new project. So um, we're going to say file new project, hit OK, go next. Uh, okay, so the, the, the working directory is, uh, I'm going to call it lights. It's the name I usually use. Um, so right now, it, this is on my virtual machine, and the virtual machine user is CSE611, so just ignore that. This would normally be your username, and then you would just add the name of your project at the end of that, and then you would give your, your project the same name as that directory. I'm going to just call it lights because ultimately, you know, usually the first project blinks lights. It's a typical hello world for a board. So I hit next on there. Uh, do you want to create it? Yes. We'll create it as an empty project. And um, okay, so here's the part that's a little obnoxious. Um, so there's uh, like a gazillion different FPGAs out there. There is a shocking amount. Um, but the problem is, is whenever you whenever you you have to set up the specific FPGA, not only the FPGA, but what package it's in and the speed grade. Uh, the package being you know the ceramic 
thing, you know, the thing you actually see when you look at the board with the pins on it, the thing that's on the circuit board, that's the package. You can have the same FPGA in multiple packages, as you, which is pretty true for any chip. Um, and then um, you have to also specify the speed grade. Um, each FPGA has a speed grade, meaning that some, some of them that come off the fab can run faster than others, and those are given a higher speed grade. Um, so in this case, the type of FPGA we're using is called a Cyclone 4E. And uh, the package is, uh, this is basically just a filter because there's so many options at the bottom, but we're going to say FBGA, which stands for uh, Flip Chip Ball Grid Array. The pin count is, uh, I don't remember, <laughs> hold on, let me refer to my slides, um, 780, speed grade 7, yeah, sorry, 780, and the speed grade is, uh, core speed grade is 7. Um, and then even once you pick all those, you still have a few options here. Uh, the one we want is the 115, is actually the biggest size. So the EP4CE115 F2C7, F29C7. Um, so the 115 stands for 115,000 gates, reconfigurable logic gates. That's the capacity of the chip. Uh, the 7 is the speed grade. The uh, F is the flip chip. I don't know what the 2.9 is. Maybe that's part of the package name. And the EP4CE is the Cyclone 4E. So that's just the part number. I hit next on there, and then next, whatever, finish. OK, so that creates a new project. OK, then according to the slides here, uh, the next step is, OK, so there's um, this sets up the FPGA, but doesn't set up the board. And that's important because the FPGA, once you set up the FPGA in the package, now Cordis knows how many pins there are. It's like, oh, there's 780 pins. About half of those pins are going to be non-reconfigurable pins, and the other half are reconfigurable in the sense that you can use them for whatever you want. However, you really can't because when they made this circuit board, they had to solder those pins to specific components, right? So the, whoever made this board decided how they were going to connect each of the user configurable FPGA pins to the, the little things that they soldered on the board, right? And that information is in a, is in a, um, a tickle file. Tickle being a little script, right, that sets up those pin mappings. So we are going to give you that file, but you have to load that in manually. Um, so I'm going to open up Chrome. <laughs> on Chrome. So I linked the, the file on, on uh, Blackboard, on Dropbox. So, not Blackboard, Dropbox, rather, sorry. Uh, oh, and I just crashed my whole VM. Wow, awesome. <laughs> OK. Um, well, let me, let me, wrong one. Let me start that back up again. In the meantime, I'm just going to download it in, uh, on here. So if you go to Blackboard and go to the course page, you will see a file at the top called DE2115 Cordis Project Settings file. Now if you click on it, it's a text file, so it'll actually display the contents. Now this thing actually has, um, it actually has a section where it also sets the FPGA up here. Um, although for whatever reason, I don't know why this is exactly, but if you don't set up the FPGA part number when you set up the project and you just load this in expecting it to use the part number there, for whatever reason, it, it doesn't work. I, don't, I haven't figured that out yet. So you have, it's a little redundant. But the important part is down here where you see there's a section for LEDs, SMA, LEDs, key, switches, those little toggle switches. And so every one of these things um, sets up a, um, an, an I.O. pin, an input or an output or an in, in out pin um, for each of the peripherals on the board. And this just sets them all up as an I.O. standard 2.5 volt because the FPGAs have reconfigurable I.O. buffers. You can, they can operate at different voltages and differential mode and single-ended mode. They're, they're pretty flexible. Um, but after you do that, you also have to actually associate them with an actual pin. And so you can see here it says set location assignment 
pin C25, C is the row, 25 is the column, and that pin is Ethernet 1 transmit data bit 0, right? So every one of the, the pins that goes out is associated not only with an I.O. You know, voltage level, but a pin as well. So that's the information we want to get out of this, out of this file. <clears throat> Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to download that by just doing a right click and say save as because it's uh, otherwise it'll just show it in the web browser. Uh, so we'll say save as. And uh, I'll just stick it on my desktop for now. And uh, oh, it's already there. And then also there's another file there called lights.sv. That is the top level file that we're going to use for Cordis. So that's the top level file, meaning that it's going to basically create a wrapper between the pins on the FPGA and the, the, the system we're going to build in, in Platform Designer. Uh, so you want to download that one as well. So I'm going to grab a copy of that one and uh, save it. And it's also there already. Okay. Alrighty. So let's get this started. I think it crashed because I got a little too aggressive with my VM settings. Okay, here we go. All right, so we come back into our terminal. And all right, so let's go to uh, Cordis. And um, so if I go into the lights directory, by the way, um, that was the directory that I created when I created the project. You'll notice it's basically empty. There is a um, lights.qpf and qsf in there. Uh, those are the two files that make up the project, that both of which are tickle script files. Um, so inside of Cordis, I will just open that project. So you can go file, open, recent projects, open that up. And it'll open that project. Now we go back to the slides here, see what the next step is. Okay, so we're going to add that lights.sv, or we're going to import those assignments I was talking about and add lights.sv. So let's do that as soon as it opens the project. <clears throat> you can see what I mean about these tools being uh, kind of clunky. Um, the project is empty, and so there's no excuse for it to take this long. Uh, but notice it's also updating this IP catalog over here, so that's probably why it's slow. Okay, so I got lights here, uh, so I'm going to go uh, to assignments, import assignments, and then I'm going to, uh, I have to copy that file first, sorry. Uh, I'm going to copy the file that I downloaded. Uh, so copy, um, what was it called, DE2, yeah, something or other, uh, and then lights.vsv. Uh, to here. All right. So we got both files. We go back to Cordis. You say import assignments. I'm going to find that DE2 115 pin assignments. I hit OK on that. And that'll import the assignments. It says uh, 1048 assignments were written out of 1065 read. And then uh, under project, sorry, under assignment settings. Now this is a little weird, but you have to go into assignment settings to add files. Uh, it's a little non-intuitive, but I'm going to add that lights.sv here as well. So I'm going to add that and then just, um, I've added that and uh, I need to scale. Um, All right. There we go. Okay. And then I hit OK on there. Okay. So now if I go over here to hierarchy and I go to files, I've got the lights.sv and you can see it there. I'm going to right click and say set as top level entity. Okay. So let me quickly show you what's in here. It's pretty simple. Um, the top level module name is called lights. The matches what the project name is. Um, all of the 
and I'm going to talk about what, what this means when I get into System Verilog. Some of you may know this if you've taken 611 already. But basically, all these inputs and outputs have to match the names that were given in that QSF file, right? So there's a finite number of possible IOs I can have on my top level module. Does that make sense? So these are the only way I can have the FPGA talk to the outside world is to have an input or output that matches one of the ones that's associated with a pin. If you put one here that's not associated with a pin, then it's not connected to anything because it won't know how to physically connect that to the outside world. Um, you notice that uh, basically I've got an input called clock 50, which is the 50 megahertz clock coming from a crystal. Uh, I got four keys, which are the buttons, and then I've got a whole bunch of things for uh, DRAM. Because this is going to connect to a DRAM, the off chip memory, and that DRAM, even though it's one DRAM channel, it's comprised of a whole bunch of individual signals that together create that channel because it's a protocol much like SPI has four signals that make up one channel. DRAM has uh, a whole, more than that, but it's basically a group of signals that make up a signal channel. You guys with me? Okay, all right, so um, now, inside the system I have nothing other than a NEO system, which I called U0. I didn't call it that, I copied this from the template it generates, but, so the NEO system, and then the NEO system has pins that I just basically connected directly to here. So all this is is a wrapper, it doesn't do anything. It just changes the name from this pins on the NEOs to the pins on the FPGA, that's it, right? So that's why I didn't, I just why I don't ma wanna make a big deal out of this, because it just changes names. Um, yeah, but the NEO system doesn't exist yet, but we haven't made it yet, so we have to make it, so we're gonna do that now. So we're gonna go over here to tools, and we're gonna go to platform designer. Make sure I'm not missing a step here. Um, uh, yes, I'm not missing a step. Okay, all right. So Platform Designer is a, a separate design tool that uh, once it comes up, oh, there it is. There it is, it's coming up. Okay, so this is the Platform Designer GUI. Um, and the idea is that we're going to put a bunch of components in here, and then they're going to get connected on the, this column. So it's like a table, um, and this is the name of the component, um, and then over here we're going to make connections between things. So these are going to be on-chip connections that uses something called the Avalon bus, which is a, an on-chip bus. Um, High-speed bus that works on chip. It's not a serial bus like SPI and I squared C or UART. It's a parallel bus. Uh, that in this case, I think it's 32 bits of data. I think these are all 32 bit wide. You guys with me? Okay, so the first thing we wanna do here is we got, the only thing it gives us here initially is the clock. We wanna add our, add our processor. So we're gonna, in the search box under the AIP catalog, you just search for NEOS, and there's a thing called here, NEOS um, embedded processor, NEOS2 processor. You double click that and it adds it to the system. Okay, so you add that and it's going to bring up this um, dialog box. Remember I told you that NEOS has an MMU you can turn on? I mentioned that. Uh, if you did want to turn that on, it would be under M MMU and MPU settings. So I can include an MMU, that's a virtual memory system that's used with an operating system. Obviously I'm not going to turn that on, I'll leave that off. In fact, I'm not going to mess with anything yet because um, you can change the cache size. So four kilobytes instruction cache right now, two kilobytes data cache. Um, and you can make a bunch of changes here, but I don't want to do anything yet, so I'm just going to hit finish. And so I've got the NEOs. So one thing you'll see here is it's starting to get a little complicated, but, but basically it's just clock and reset. Everything on here has a clock and a reset. Uh, then you have a data master and an instruction master. Those are the two important ones for you because the data master allows you to, allows the processor to request to do reads for the instruction memory, and the data master allows it to do reads and writes for both the data memory and all the peripherals in the system. So the only thing you need to connect the, the, data, the instruction master to is the instruction memory, whatever that happens to be, and the, but the data master probably should be connected to everything else unless you know, you, you have another master in there that you want to connect to something. But in this case, we're going to run everything from one processor. You got, does that make sense? Okay. All right. So then, uh, and then there's um, some other things in there. There's a um, IRQ, which, you know, we talked about that. Uh, and then there's some debug inputs. And then there's a custom instruction master. That's pretty cool. That allows you to create your own instructions. So this is a MIPS processor. 
It has the standard MIPS instructions that you guys all learn in 2.12, but if you want to add your own instructions, you can add new instructions. And if you do, you add them, you would connect them to this instruction master port. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's all we need for now. Uh, the next thing we want to add is, um, we need to add a, um, an SDRAM interface. So that's the, the SDRAM controller that's going to talk to uh, the, the, uh, the RAM. Uh, this is the same kind of memory technology that you have in any computer, it's SDRAM. Uh, we're going to use the SDRAM controller for Intel FPGA IP. Now there are some settings we have to change in here. This is a 32-bit wide memory, chip select 1-bit, banks 4, row, there's uh, 13 bits for row and 10 bits for column, I think. Uh, I got to check, I don't remember. Uh, 13 row 10, yeah, 13 row 10 column. Okay. 13, 10, done. Hit OK, and then we got that. Okay, next is um, clock manager, another clock source, and our JTAG UART. Okay, and then we'll be done for now. So we need a clock manager. Um, the clock manager. System and SDRAM clocks for DE series boards. So this is actually a component that's made specifically for this board. It came from uh, the guy that runs the university program over at uh, Altera and now Intel. Um, basically, it is a, uh, it's a, it's a phase lock loop. It's an analog circuit that converts uh, the 50 megahertz clock that comes in from the crystal to the clock speed suitable, clock speed and phase that's suitable for the SDRAM. You guys with me? Because the SDRAM doesn't run at the same speed as the, as the processor, which you guys, I'm sure you guys know that. In a real computer, the SDRAM runs at like 800 megahertz and your CPU runs at 4 gigahertz. So there's a big difference in those two clock speeds. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, it's a DE2150. You just hit finish on that. Nothing to change there. And then um, you have to also add, and this is something that's a little, a uh, little obnoxious, but uh, you have to add this clock source because um, so the problem is is that the clock. The clock manager creates a 27 megahertz or whatever the speed is for the off, off, off chip uh, SDRAM, and you're going to use that to clock your SDRAM controller. The problem is, is that the SDRAM itself needs that same clock. You have to bring it off chip, and the only way to get the SDRAM clock off chip is to add this clock source, which basically just adds a port. So it, it doesn't really do anything other than provides a way to get the clock, at the, the SDRAM clock off the chip. And then finally, uh, we're going to add the UART, which is a way to get a console connection. Now, we talked about how UART works in, in the class. Uh, this thing, JTAG UART for Intel FPGA, uh, this thing is um, a UART that actually runs over the JTAG. The JTAG is um, not a, uh, it's like a side channel debug port to the FPGA. And they, because we have this really cool thing called a USB blaster that Altera uses, the, the USB blaster allows you to piggyback a UART connection over the programming cable. Right, so when you program the FPGA from your workstation, you can use the same cable to print Hello World over it, which is pretty cool. And you might think, well, that, don't they all have that? No. The other FPGA company, Xilinx, does not. You need two separate cables for that. Um, and then this, this thing, um, and then the this UART you know, integrates with everything. So I think that's all we need, right? Uh, processor, SDRAM, clock manager, clock source, UART, yep, we're done. Okay, now this is the hard part though. Now we gotta connect everything. Um, <clears throat> so we have all the stuff here, but they're not connected. So um, this is probably the trickiest part here, but you only have to do it once. Um, I mean, you do it once, I mean, you can add to it after you do it once, but once you do it once, then you can write different software and run different software on here. Um, okay, so um, the first thing you want to do is, I'm just going to follow the slide so I don't make a mistake. Okay, so I'm going to start with the clock zero component. I'm going to clock, connect the clock output to the ref clock on the PLL. Okay, so the first thing that happens is we have two clock sources in here. One of them is used for input and one of them is used for output. This one's your input one. So the clock comes in and you can see, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but you see there's a little port here, there's a little, little pin. 
and it says export clock, that means that this is a pin that's exposed and it's an input pin called clock, right? So this is how we're gonna clock the whole system. The clock's gonna come in here, but we have to run it to the phase lock loop because this is only a reference clock and the phase lock loop is what's gonna provide our actual clock. Now you might say, why not just use that as your clock? You can, but then you can't change the speed, but we're not gonna change the speed anyway. But it's also a messy clock. It's coming off of a, a piezoelectric crystal. It's not a good clock signal. It's, it's dirty, it's noisy. It's coming from a crystal. We want to clean it up and so use this phase lock loop to make it into a cleaner signal. So, um, so we're gonna take this clock output and we're gonna trace this down and we're gonna go down to this phase lock loop thing and we're gonna connect it. You see there's a bubble right there. So this turns into like a, um, I don't know if you guys ever studied um, programmable logic arrays, PLAs, if you talked about that in 211. PLAs have like a, a vertical wires and horizontal wires and then you can connect, <laughs> you, can, you can make connections to connect any horizontal to any vertical wire. It's basically what this is, this is a virtual PLA. So the idea is, is that um, I'm gonna trace this clock output down and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a connection to this reference clock input by clicking that little bubble there. You might be saying, like, there's got to be a better way to do that than finding bubbles in that thing. This is ridiculous. Uh, nah, maybe with tickle commands, but I don't see a tickle console here, so unclear. Unclear how to do it. I don't know how else to do this, but um, it is kind of silly. But yeah, so we're going to make this connection here. All right, now once you make the connection, look, it highlights that wire, so now you can see it's clearly connected there, right? All right, so now we've got the reference clock now we've got this thing called sysclock, which is the output, and we're going to use this as the clock for our NEOS processor. So, bink, connect that. And we're going to use it for, not the SDRAM controller, we have our own clock for that. Uh, we're going to use it for the UART. So, bink, and is that it? I guess that's it for now. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, there's also a reset input, which is going to be connected to one of the switches or the buttons on the board. That reset, it, you see there's a reset clock in reset, has called re, has an input export called reset. So that's the pin and the corresponding output for that is called clock reset. And we're just going to use the same, the, the raw reset. Directly from the switch, we're going to use that to reset all our stuff. You might say, well, wait, isn't that dangerous? I mean, that button needs to be debounced, right? Isn't it going to put a, you're going to push it and it's going to be bouncing around and stuff? Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to work though for us. Um, I don't know if there's an integrated debouncer in these buttons or what, but it's always worked uh, to do it that way. Um, and that's how the, you know, the, temp the templates work that come with the board. So I'm going to take this reset output here and I'm going to connect it to the reset on the CPU and the reset on the SDRAM controller and the reset on the phase lock loop and the reset, I won't connect that one, and the reset on the JTAG UART. All right, so I got my resets wired up. Okay. Now, on the NEOS processor, we have a data master and an instruction master. Right now, they're both, they're both looped back to this debug port. I don't know why they do that. Seems like that's something that could be done internally. But for whatever reason, the data master and the instruction master loop back to this debug because this way we can debug with it. We can monitor stuff over JTAG. So that's why they do it. I just don't know why they do it externally. But we also want to connect those to the SDRAM uh, so we're going to take the instruction master and the data master and we're going to connect them both to the slave port on the SDRAM controller because both our instructions and data come from the SDRAM. Yes? Sorry, but why do you need two different clock units on this? So, so, so that's a good question. The, the, this clock is used to input as an input for clock and reset. So this is used to create an input port for both the reference clock coming from the crystal externally and the reset button. The other clock, this one, is used for an output port to get the SDRAM clock, which is generated internally, out of the FPGA to the physical SDRAM memory on, on the chip. So there right. are, in essence, two different communication channels, one for input, one for output? Yes, yes. You can't use the same clock source for input and output. I don't know why. That, that's right, but that was referring to the programming cable and the, and the console UART connection, but yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny is that the older versions of the software didn't require this, and there may be a way to work around this, actually, that I haven't found yet. But right now, this is the only way to do it, because if you don't add this, you get all those DRAM, let me show you, wait, actually, let's go back to Cordis, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So this is, uh, the, I don't know if you can read that from back there, but if you look at the DRAM ports, there's a, tw there's a 13 bit address, a 2 bit bank address, column access strobe, clock enable, chip select, data, 32 bits, obviously, uh, DQM, which is the byte enable, so which byte of the 32 bits you want to enable, usually it's all, all four, but sometimes you just want to have individual bytes. Row access strobe, column access strobe, uh, write enable, and then clock. There's an output called DRAM clock. But when you only add the DRAM controller to the, uh, the system, it doesn't create the clock output, so we're doing that explicitly. I probably keep confused even more, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's basically the idea is that we need to be able to drive this DRAM clock output because it's physically connected to a wire that goes to the DRAM chip. It's the only way to get a clock for that. Okay, so uh, back to uh, here. Uh, so we've got mastership of the uh, SD RAM. Now for the, um, for the JTAG UART, we need to master that too, but only the data master, not the instruction master. Because I'm not going to get instructions from the, from the JTAG, I'm only going to use the data to drive that because it's a peripheral uh, for you know, just outputting stuff. Did I get that right? Please tell me I got that right. Data master, yeah. All right. Um, and then uh, if you look at the PLL here, this is the PLL, the SD RAM, uh, the, sorry, the uh, Sys SD RAM PLL, it's really the clock source. It puts out a Sys clock, which we've already connected. There's also an SD RAM clock. We have to connect that to two things. The first is the DRAM controller, which is here, and this clock output that I was just, the clock in on this clock source that I was just telling you about. So if I click that, you can see it fans out the two things. SDRAM clock gets generated, it goes to the SDRAM controller, and it goes to this output pin. Okay? I told you it was going to be a little confusing, but like I said, this is, this is literally what, like, this is the kind of process they use, like when Apple creates a new chip for the iPhone, they have to, they, they pick, a, uh, they pick uh, components from a repertoire of IP blocks, and then they connect them on a common on-chip bus basically doing this. Not all components connect to all the other components, but so you have to be careful how the connections are made. All right, um, and then I think that's about it. Um, there's a few other minor things we have to do. Uh, this clock source, we have to export this clock output. So I'm going to double click that to export, and I'm going to call it SDRAM clock. SDRAM underscore CLK, and I have to export the SDRAM controller wire which I'll just give it the default name. And I think that's about it, I think. Oh, in this IRQ. The, um, the UART has an IRQ, so that way if you're talking, if you're communicating with a user at a, a terminal and you wanna wait till the user hits a key, like the CPU has to be alerted to that, um, if you're, you know, like you say, press any key. Right? How's the, how's the CPU know you've pressed a key? There needs to be an interrupt. Um, luckily, there's only one thing on this whole design that can accept an interrupt, and that's the CPU, so that's a no-brainer. You just hit the one, there's just one option there. So we'll just hit, connect that wire there. It's the only, only possibility. I think that's it. Uh, let's go back, double check the slide. Did I forget anything? Nope. I think we're good. Okay, one other thing um, I want to point out is um, you'll notice that there's a column here called base and N. This is the programmed I.O. thing that I, that I covered, right? I, that, this is kind of like the quiz question I asked you about. You know, you have a peripheral and it has a starting address and an ending address. So every peripheral in here is going to have an address range and also an IRQ, potentially. Um, the addresses need to be specified. Sometimes they're added automatically, but sometimes you have to explicitly tell the thing to generate addresses ran, um, automatically. So you go up to system and you say assign base addresses for that. Okay? Notice I cleared up a lot of these errors down here by doing that. You guys with me? Now, by the way, um, for example, if I were running Linux on here, 
Linux would have to know these before it even boots the kernel, which is why in order to boot Linux, you need a kernel and a device tree file. You need two things to boot a Linux machine. This is the information in the device tree, these address ranges for the peripherals. Okay? Um, so, you know, I would have to create a custom device tree if I wanted to boot Linux on here, in other words, right? Um, because I have the ability to change those addresses, and if I change the address in hardware, it needs to be updated in the operating system, or in this case, in the how. Uh, okay, so the last errors I have down here are because the the, uh, the compiler is not going to know, when I compile code, it's got to know where to link the code, what memory to link it into. And so for that, I have to go up to the Neo settings here again, and I can only do this now that I've added the memory, and I have to go to this vectors tab, and I have to say that the, I have to specify the SD RAM controller as the place where my data, my instructions are, my data and my instructions. Um, so, in the way that you do it is not by saying this is where your data and your instructions are. You do it by saying this is where my reset vector is, which is a really indirect, weird way of doing it. I don't know why they haven't changed that, but that's the way you specify your target memory. And now I've got no error, so I'm good to go. So now I'm just going to say, any questions about that, by the way? Okay, so I've now created a whole system. I've got a CPU, I've got a console, I've got an SD RAM controller, and I've got, well, that's it so far. Eventually, we're going to add some other ports, you know, GPIO, we're going to add some ability to do some other stuff. But for now, we've got enough here to run. Oh, by the way, there's 128 megabytes of SD RAM on here. You might say, why do you even use an SD RAM? Why not just use on-chip memory for your program? You could, but the FPGA only has about like 64 kilobytes, and that's, I don't think that's enough to store the, the HAL, the BSP. The BSP is huge. It's overly, overly, it's bigger than it ought to be. It's, 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 so I, I don't know about fitting that all on chip. Uh, so we're going to use the off-chip memory for that. Okay, I think we're ready to go. I'm just going to hit generate HDL, generate, oh, one more thing, sorry, cancel. So one thing I did forget. Uh, we want to say save, file, save as. And I want to give a name, Neos underscore system for this. That's important because that's how I refer to it in the top level design. Now I'm going to hit, now I'm going to hit, uh, so it saves it. It takes an inordinate amount of time to save as usual because everything these CAD tools do takes 10 times longer than it ought to. There, it finally saved it. So now I can hit generate HDL and hit generate. And now it's going to run a bunch of Java slash Perl hybrid monstrosity Frankenstein stuff to generate this. But what it's doing now is it's going to generate the system Verilog code uh, needed to essentially assemble this whole thing in hardware, right? So you could design this by hand, but it would take forever. Basically, what this is doing is automating the process of designing a very complex system, right? Now, if you want to, if you want to add stuff to this that you design by hand, you're 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 able to do that. Like I can build my own IP module and I can add it. I can add my own little radar processing peripheral and just stick it into the system and then interact with it from my software if I want to. Or my own GPU. I can just drop my own GPU in there if I want. Uh, there's no GPUs for this thing, but I can make one if I wanted to. And if I did, I could put it in here. Okay, so that thing generated successfully. So that wasn't too bad. Um, and now we go back to Cordis and I'm going to just import that file. Now it actually created a bunch of files. But the only one that you have to import is the, the QSYS file, the, the, the little file that contains all that information. Uh, so I'm going to go again to Assignments, Settings, Files, hit dot, 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 add neosystem.qsys, and hit OK, and it's in there. And then one last thing I need to do is the only thing missing is that I've got all the pin mappings done, I've got the design done, but the tools don't know what the clock speed is. It knows what the clock pin is, it knows what the clock name is, right? But it doesn't actually know what the clock speed is, which is important because when it converts this to hardware, to a programming file, it has to generate in a way that it can make timing, meaning that the logic is fast enough to keep up with the clock, that all the, 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 the critical path inside the clock, the, 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 the logic can, can be done in the clock period. You guys with me? So. Um, if you took uh, 611, you know what I'm talking about. We, we cover that in 611, how that time enclosure works. Um, so how do I do that? I have to create a new file. 
which I'm actually going to do manually. This is going to be a synopsis, synopsis design constraints file. And I'm going to say create underscore clock. And I don't remember exactly what the syntax is, so I have to refer to this. Uh, uh, dash name clock underscore 50. And then um, dash period 20. I'm just going to copy this actually. <coughs> copy and paste. If it lets me do that in the VM. It does. Okay, cool. So, um, so this says that my clock is clock 50. Uh, I'm going to get it from the clock 50 port. The period is 20 nanoseconds, which is 50 megahertz. And I'm going to derive PLL clocks, meaning that if this thing is a reference clock for a PLL, and that PLL is designed to multiply the clock frequency by a factor of two, then just assume that the output of that has got to be at 100 megahertz. Right? So this is a derived PLL clocks. Um, and that's it. We're now save it as SD, SDC1. And we're good to go. Hit the go button. And now it will compile this into hardware. So our objective here is to get something called an SOF file, a serial object file, serial object file, soft file. That's the file that actually you send to the FPGA to make the logic magically appear on it. That's the configuration file. Sometimes they call it the bitstream file. The reason they call it a bitstream file is that it goes into the FPGA through JTAG. And even though I haven't covered it yet, I, it is actually a topic in this lecture, but I, I'll come back to JTAG here in a minute. JTAG is like SPI and UART and I squared C in that it is a bit serial protocol. So all the bits that configure the FPGA go in one by one. And that's why they call this a bitstream file. That's also why it takes a really long time to configure the FPGA, as you will see once I get the soft file to show you. Um, OK, now you'll notice that the tools are slow. This slowness is understandable, though, because it's actually building the actual gates. It's taking the, it has to parse the system Verilog. It has to convert it to a, a, a net list, which is a graph of logic gates. And then it has to map each of those logic gates onto the physical gates on the FPGA and then form connections between them. It takes a long time. It's an MP complete problem to do optimally. But um, it, they use simulated annealing to do it quick. I mean, relatively quick. But it still takes a while as you're waiting for it here. Um, so, and you're going to see a lot of messages. Uh, you're not going to understand any of these. Um, well, some of them you might, but mostly these right now it's just saying that it's finding all these uh, modules that were generated by SOPC Builder. Or, sorry, platform, platform Designer. So Platform Designer was a tool that we built the platform in. When we hit Generate, it didn't generate just one file. It generated a couple dozen files. And now it's talking about all of those individual files here. Um, now we got some uh, warnings. It's saying, inside the SD RAM controller that I didn't even make, conditional expression evaluates to a constant. So shame on Intel. It wasn't my design. Cordis is complaining about it. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages will print as it compiles. This is another downside of these tools, because if there are any legitimate messages in here, things that you did wrong, you're probably going to miss them. So that's, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't, never found a good solution to that. Um, yeah, PLL for D-series boards is connected to a signal with three, the formal, the blah, blah, blah. Yeah, uh, not my problem. Hopefully it still works. OK, so it's still <laughs> generating, still compiling. Uh, while that's doing that, I want to just double check and make sure. Hopefully, I didn't forget anything. I'm going to because if you do, you have to go back and recompile. Um, uh, so all of the steps are here. Uh, so I talked about that. Okay. So this is the next step, slide 18. We'll just wait till it finishes. It's almost done. Now, this is taking a little longer than it would in the lab because I'm running a virtual machine on top of Windows. In, in the lab, you're running Linux natively, so it's going to be faster. Also, those are desktop computers, and this is a laptop. So it won't take quite this long. Um, but compiling designs for an FPGA in general does take long. Yes? Will we be doing this in the lab on Wednesday? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, so on Wednesday, my plan for today is I'm going to show you how to get this basic system set up, and then on Wednesday I'm going to give you another tutorial on how to actually add the components needed to talk to the lights on the board, to actually make it light up and do blinking lights. I don't have um, time to do that today, but I'm just I'm going to give you enough to print Hello World, but not enough to blink lights. We'll do that on Wednesday. All right. Do, 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 do. Still compiling. 98% on analysis. Oh, there we go. Synthesis finished. These are all the steps that goes through analysis and synthesis, fitter and assembler, and timing analysis. And uh, we're done with, uh, I think analysis and synthesis are usually the longest ones. <clears throat> Okay, now while that's running, I'm going to show you how to actually configure the FPGA. So we're going to do that in the command line too. There is a GUI for that, uh, but I'm just going to show you how to do it in the, the command line. So first of all, um, in order to talk to the FPGA, you have to run a JTAG daemon. Uh, the way that works is um, JTAG is a protocol, um, and the way they, they handle that is they run a server that uh, basically creates a JTAG connection to the FPGA. And then all the applications that want to use it just connect to that server over sockets, kind of like a, an internet program, right? Make sense? If any of you have ever done any Android development, you've, al you've also done this. The Android uh, also uses JTAG when you plug in your Android phone and USB and connect it to the Android SDK. It uses the same kind of connection when you launch ADB, Android Debugger. It's, the same, it's basically the same as that. Okay, that's what this is. Uh, so we're going to run uh, JTAG-D. Now the problem is, normally you would just run JTAG-D. However, there is a problem with the lab setup that I haven't been able to figure out. Um, if you just run JTAG-D by itself, for whatever reason, it doesn't, it doesn't, you get an error. So we had to add this uh, parameter to make it work. We didn't have to do this in years past. It's something that came up with the newer version of Cordis and the newer lab environment. Um, but, uh, sorry, I screwed that up. So it's JTAG D dash, uh, dash dash config, and then you just give it a long path to um, this parts list. Tells, gives it the parts for the FPGA, and then dash dash user start, meaning that you're starting it manually. Now, on my machine, I don't have user local third party, so I have to adjust the location of this. Uh, so I'll get that ready now. I have it in opt in, uh, sorry, not top, opt Intel FPGA uh, 18.1 um, Cordis. Yeah. So I just have to modify the path that this file is, is in. Uh, so I'm going to run that. Uh, um, er, now why did I not get this earlier today? Lib CCL ver cannot open share. Uh, okay. Um, uh, okay, let's do it this way then. JTAG D. Let's put that in again. Uh, but this time I'm going to specify a library path for it. You should not have to do this part in the lab. If you do, then I'll fix it. Uh, opt Intel FPGA slash 18.1 slash Quartus slash Linux 64. Same thing. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Uh, well, okay, that's, that's not a big deal. I'm almost out of time here anyway. So, um, Okay, so uh, actually, I'll tell you what. I will continue this in the lab. I don't know. My, uh, my, this must be my VM setup, but I'm getting a um, libccl ver. Normally, you fix that. By, oh, I know why. I misspelled opt. That's why. Duh. Uh, there we go. Now it works. <laughs> Sorry, I just misspelled. I had, instead of opt, I had top. Okay, that starts the JTAG, and then um, are we done compiling yet? Uh, nope, still going. Okay, so it takes a while to come. Oh, almost done. It, 88 netlist writer. Look, 99, almost done. That should just finish. Boom, done. Okay, good. Now to configure it, um, I just type um, 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 neos2 configure soft, 
and the generated file is in a directory called output files. Now notice, by the way, I'm in the lights directory. I'm in my projects directory when I'm doing this. So relative to that, there's a subdirectory called output files, and the output file is called lights.sof. Okay, and this will configure it. Now, um, now when I configure it, you're going to know it works because this thing is already configured, right? And it's blinking and stuff. As soon as I configure this guy, it's going to stop dead and, and go into my configuration. It's not my configuration doesn't do any kind of blinking lights thing. So I'm going to hit uh, enter on that, and there we go. Oh, you see, it just it just stopped now. The thing about this is you'll notice that these lights, it's kind of interesting. These LEDs are dim, but they're on. Why are they dim? They're dim because I didn't connect them to anything. They're actually coming, they're actually floating. The FPGA is not driving them at all with any voltage. And so the actual voltage is, is floating. And because these are active low LEDs, one side is tied to VDD and the other side is supposed to be tied to ground when you want to turn them on. When they're floating, you get a partial voltage drop over them, so they're kind of dim, right? That's what happens when they're not connected. So if your goal is to actually light these up and you see them dim like that, you, your connections are dead. You, you have a, you have a, there's something wrong, they're not connected. But I didn't actually connect them to anything in the FPGA design, which is why they're dead. It's also why the hex display went off. Now, the LCD still says, welcome to the Altera DE2115, but that's because the, the LCD display has its own independent controller that remembers the last thing it was sent to print. And so that message will stay on there even though I don't have pins for the LCD either, right? Likewise, I don't have pins going to Ethernet. So if I plug this into Ethernet, the switch will be like, what? What is this? What? You know, this, the, the Ethernet switch will not see anything either um, because, again, I'm not, I'm not driving... All right, well, they have an independent controller too, though, so they might they, they probably just have you know zero. Okay, so here's this is the platform design. Uh, hopefully, you most of you have this set up already. Uh, so I've got the clock source, like I mentioned, this is just a port. Uh, that's the processor. Uh, then there's the SD RAM controller. This is the clocks. This is the this is the PLL. It's an analog circuit that just cleans up the external clock, and the clock, second clock source, the JTAG UART, and then I also added, I added these uh, outside of class, but you need them for the project. There's this performance counter unit and the LEDs. It's the parallel I.O. to control the LEDs. Uh, so these, the way I have this set up now is, is exactly the way you want to have your system set up. You may have slight differences in the names of some of these components. And if you do, you, you might run into a compiler error when you compile in Cordis, but that's not a big deal because if you go back to Cordis and you say file open, and you go into the Neo system directory, which I'm already in, uh, and you look at this inst, I think I showed this last time. Um, oh, sorry, that's not the right one. Um, oh, wait, uh, Oh, it is, but that's the VHDL one, that's why. That's the VHDL version. We want to look at the Verilog version. Uh, there's the Verilog version. Okay, so <clears throat> the, this is how, this is a template for being able to drop this Neo system into your, into your design, into your top level design. And so the important thing to note here is that this is showing you what the, the ports are on the Neo system, which are not obvious by looking at SOP, uh, sorry, platform designer. Does it make sense? Okay. So for example, L notice there's LEDs export. You may have called that something different. Uh, and if you did, you just have to make the corresponding change over here in your lights.sv. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, so once you have uh, the, uh, the code, the code generated in Platform Designer and compiled here in uh, Quartus, which I believe I already have, then we can um, we can uh, start with the software. Mm -hmm. Bless you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, so to configure this guy, uh, you just do uh, Neos2 configure soft. And so the soft file is in the output files directory, so it's just lights.soft. Lights and See, now this is where you sometimes run into connectivity issues. Oh, that's working now, though. Seems to be fine. So you can see that it went from blinking. Now it's kind of, you know, it's in con configuration mode. 
and it's configuring. Okay, so we're good. And then, um, so we have the platform on here, but the program, the software, there's no software on it. It's just the, it's, um, uh, this, the CPU is doing what right now? I, it's probably in some kind of infinite loop somewhere. Um, good question, though. I don't actually know what it's doing. When you, when you configure it and you don't have software on it, the CPU must be executing instructions. It might just be uh, executing no ops or something. Okay, but we need, so the point is we need to get software on there. So for that, uh, I'm gonna go in the lights directory, make a software folder. And I, I showed, I, I, I showed uh, there was a few groups that I sat down with in lab and showed this, in, um, but I just wanna make sure everyone's on the same page. So I'm gonna go in the software directory, and then there's a command, uh, neos to create soft, uh, what is it again, uh, software create, uh, I can't remember it. I gotta check the, so it's in the, if you go to the lab sheet, it is uh, right here, Neos2 software example create. So I'm just gonna just copy and paste this because <laughs> this is a long command. Um, but the idea is that, oh, right, hold on. Just put everything on one line here. All right. Hold on, that should be a space there. All right. Okay, so uh, we're saying that we want to create a software example, which is this Hello World program. It's kind of just like a, um, a template that we can start on. Uh, this name is Lights. I don't actually, I don't even know where this name is used, actually, because at the end of this command, you specify that the app directory is lights and the BSP directory is lights underscore BSP, which are just like two different software projects, you, like for example, that you would see in Eclipse if you were using Eclipse. Um, and then you, you target the CPU, you can only target a specific CPU. So like in 3.13, one of the things we do in that class that we won't do in this class is, is do a multi-core system where you have multiple processors. But even if you have multiple processors, you still have to, each software project has to target a specific processor because uh, the only way to have, you know, in, 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 the only way to do true multi-core processing is have an operating system. Because this is bare metal, we have to target a specific CPU. Uh, and then the type is hello world, and then you have to point it back to your Neo system uh, configuration file. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and do that. And then this will create lights and lights.bsp. If we go to lights, we, there's a script in there called create this app, and that will create um, all the files we need. Why wasn't that done in the last step? Uh, it's unclear, just the way those scripts are set up here. Uh, it's also doing a build, so it's compiling a bunch of stuff. Notice it's running, um, uh, it's scrolling by, but notice it's running Neos2 Elf G++, or Neos2 Elf GCC. These are the cross compilers. So you're compiling stuff for Neos on an Intel machine. Um, okay, now one thing that I want to point out here is that there's this lights BSP directory and there's a script in here as well called create this BSP. If you make any changes to your hardware in the platform designer and then you know you regenerate your hardware, make sure you remember to reprogram the FPGA one, but also you have to run this create this BSP every time you change your hardware. So if you change anything in platform designer, you're gonna have to rerun this and it'll, it'll give you an error if you don't. Uh, but basically this just regenerates the, you know, the software layer for the hardware that you have in your platform. Make sense? Okay, all right. Um, okay, so now, um, I'm gonna go into Tmux because it's, it's useful to have two, two windows open when you start writing your software for this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go to lights and if you look in this directory, you've got um, lights.elf, that's the, that's the compiled, uh, that's the binary, that's, your, that's the compiled version of your program that you used to, to program the FPGA. Uh, then there's uh, object, lights.objectdump, which is the same thing except it's a readable, it's a text version of it. Uh, and then you've got um, hello world.c, and then there's a make file. Now there are ways to modify, there are scripts that you can use to modify this make file. 
Uh, but we're assuming that you're just going to put everything in the one, you know, the hello world.c, all your code. Um, so if we check that out, you can see it just says hello from Neos2. Uh, now to, obviously it's already built. If I type make, it says, you know, it's already done. So if I type Neos2 download, I can just put lights.elf and it'll download. It'll download that program to the board. And there it is. Um, now notice it says leaving target processor paused because I forgot to put dash G at the end of that. Uh, that uh, Neos2 download dash G just says go. This time it says starting processor. And then this is the address. And if you go back to your SOP, uh, sorry, I keep calling it, used to be called SOPC builder, now it's called platform designer. If you go back to platform designer, uh, you'll notice that you can cross reference this address and it corresponds to your, your SD RAM. Right? Remember, we talked about like every, every peripheral has a range of addresses. So this address falls within the range of your SD RAM. Um, okay, so it should be uh, printing hello world, right? So if I type JTAG, uh, sorry, um, Neos2 terminal. Can I just, yeah, that's it. You don't need any, okay, well there it is. It already printed hello, <laughs> hello from Neos2. Apparently that message was uh, queued from having run it earlier, right? So this is the terminal. Um, I've never actually, um, I'm sure it's possible, but I don't believe I've actually ever set this up where I could type stuff in this terminal. I think in theory you can go, there's, the, the communication is two ways. You, you could type messages for the CPU, We've always just used it for output purposes, but I think, you know, like I said, there's an interrupt connected for that inside your platform. So in principle, you could have something that says press any key to continue, and then you can hit enter and have it go, like in the terminal, right? I just haven't never tried it. Uh, okay, so then uh, the terminal kind of just hangs out until you control C and, and uh, break it. All right, so the next thing I want to look at here is how do we talk to the performance counters? Now, you might be thinking, I don't know if I made this clear last week, but why are we using a performance counter? What is that all about? The performance counter is a, it's designed to measure performance. And we use it in 3.13 a lot to basically measure how fast the code is running. And the whole objective in that class is to speed up code. In this class, it's going to be about controlling things and communication. Um, but in this class, we're still going to use the performance counter to, as, as basically as a clock. So it's, it's, just a, it's just a counter that counts every clock cycle, and it gives us very fine grain, fine grain measurement control. We can measure time down to a 50 millionth of a second because that clock ticks every cycle, and the clock is running at 50 megahertz, right? So we, get, we can track... We can, we can measure the, the passage of time, which is very important for doing control because when you do control, there's this assumption that you have this control period and, and um, you know, every so often you execute, you, you read the actuators, you calculate the outputs and then you, or you read the sensors, you calculate the outputs and then you actuate your system. Does that make sense? Uh, now in this lab, you're gonna use it for controlling the duty cycle and the period of the pulse width modulation. And so that's the whole reason uh, we, we've got that in there. Okay, so if I modify hello world.c, uh, a couple things you want to add here to the headers. There's uh, io.h, and then there's uh, system.h, and then there's um, um, oh, alt types.h. Okay, so um, this is for printf. io.h is for the io read, io write. Those are just the io read and write uh, intrinsics. System.h has your addresses in it for your peripherals, your base addresses. Of course, you could key them in manually if you want to, but then if they change, if they change in, in Platform Designer, then your code will stop working. And then um, alt types is for the, the basic types, the Altera types. You don't have to use that. It's up to you. Uh, so in other words, you know, if you have alt types, you can use alt underscore u32 as opposed to saying unsigned int, right? Just a more explicit way. Generally speaking, when you embed embedded system design, you, usually your types are more explicit than int and char and short. You know, usually you use some kind of a type library. Okay, all right, so then, um, so also, uh, let's see, set tab stop equals uh, The other thing you can do is, Sorry, uh, set shift width equals four. There we go. All right, so let me fix some things up here a bit. Okay, so now uh, another easy trap to get in. Well, first of all, your, your embedded software is generally going to run an infinite loop. Uh, if you ever did any Arduino 
type design with the Arduino IDE. You don't have to put a loop in there, but there's actually a function called loop, which you can fill in, and then that, that is actually in an infinite loop, but the loop is structured externally to that function. In this case, we have to put the loop in. Um, one, one easy mistake to make is if I were to put this printf inside this loop, it breaks it because it prints, it prints so fast that something happens, some buffer gets filled, and it, and it destroys the, the state of the UART, JTAG UART. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, why don't they just like, why doesn't it just block, make the code wait for the buffer to clear? Uh, unclear, I don't know why they didn't, I don't know why they didn't write it like that. But if you print really fast, it can cause, uh, cause issues. So I wanna just print outside that loop, and then inside the loop, uh, oh, and one other thing I want to do is I mentioned that the performance counter needs to be started. Why? Again, I don't know why they chose that, they made that decision. To start it up, it's pretty easy, you just do IO write. Okay, now where do I write to? Uh, if you go inside the BSP directory and you look at that system.h, this is all the stuff, basically these are just all constants, right, that are generated from your platform. So I usually have this open and that way I can go to, I can find the performance counter. You can see the performance counter base is right there. So then I can just um, I can just paste that right there. So I can write I can write to the performance counter. And then um, the you have to tell it to go and I forget how to do that now. Uh, I know I have it in here somewhere. Uh, ah yes here it is. Uh, number one. Yeah my okay so um, if you write to the, now again, by the way, if you had renamed your performance counter in Platform Designer, it would have a different name. This is the default name. Um, performance counter zero base. Um, I'm going to write the value zero to register one. That just starts the counter. Again, why doesn't it just always start it? I, I don't know. It seems kind of strange, but I, uh, you have to start it and that would be outside the loop. So. Now, another thing that's strange here is that that one, that one should really be a four, right? Because the, the control registers, which is what I'm writing, are 32 bits. So if this is the base and my offset is there, then that shouldn't be a one, that should be a four, right? Well, it's multiplying that by a four for you, right? So, you, so these, these, this is like saying um, control register one, but it goes up by one, but in reality, the addresses are incrementing by four. Uh, and then the value zero is just a, is just a magic number. You, write, you have to write zero to that register to start the counter. That's something that would be in the documentation. I just pulled it out of the documentation. Okay. Um, okay, so that'll start it, and then once I'm in there, oh, I also need a variable that I will use the alt types for. I'll say alt u32 count. This is a 30, 60, oh, sorry, 30, 64-bit counter. And then um, in order to write, in order to read a 64-bit counter with 32-bit CPU, you have to read twice. You have to read the bottom 32 bits and the top 32 bits. So I'll say count equals IO read um, performance counter base. And the upper part, I believe, is in one. Yeah, it's in one, right? Yeah. One, and then I'm going to shift that to the right by 32 bits, but there's a catch, you have to typecast this 32 by alt u64 because the compiler needs to know that you're doing a 64-bit shift as opposed to a 32-bit shift. And so you have to play this kind of this trick where, um, actually I think you have to typecast that too as well, don't you? Um, yeah, I do have it. Uh, I don't know, maybe try it with, a, I'll try it without it and see what happens. But so I'm reading um, address, you know, control, register one. Now you might say, wait a second, hold on, hold on. You just wrote to zero, you just wrote zero into that same place and now you're reading from it. Aren't you going to get zero? Well, in this case, the read and the write behavior of that register are different. Just because I wrote zero to it doesn't mean I'm going to read zero from it because writing to it tells it to go and reading from it gives me the, the performance counter, right? Which doesn't seem to make sense. But it's not like, it's not a real register in other words. It's, it's, it's kind of hacky, you know, like the reading and writing 
action, when you read or write, it does two different things. It's not like you're writing a value and then you're reading that value back. That zero that I just wrote to it is gone. It never actually got registered. It was just sent as a signal to start, right? It wasn't actually writing the value of zero, which is why now I'm doing an IO read, which is the opposite of the IO write to the same address, and yet I'm getting a different value. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna read that, and then I'm gonna read, the lo that was the upper 32 bits, and then I'm gonna read the lower 32 bits. So I'm just gonna do IO read, performance counter, I think that's in zero, and then I'm not gonna shift that. Okay, hopefully that'll, that'll be good. Okay, and then finally, the last thing I wanna do is, I just wanna put the counter value, I could print it to the console, um, I could do that, or, I could use the LEDs to display it. I'm gonna use the LEDs. So the LEDs is, you can use those with just IO write, and I gotta go back to my system.h, find, figure out what that, okay, I got LEDs base in here, so I just search for LEDs. And then um, I'm gonna put that in there. Um, the LEDs just have, they don't, they just have the one register, so that will always be a zero. Again, this is offset, you know, like which, which of the registers you wanna write. And then the value I want to write is going to be count. Now the problem here is that, keep in mind that one, there's two problems here. Count is 64 bits and I only have 26 LEDs, right? So that's an issue. The other issue is that, remember that counter is going up, is, is ticking up every 50 millionth of a second, right? So in order to be able to see it actually counting, I'm going to divide the counter. I'm going to take the counter and effectively divide it by some large enough number that it will have to increment a whole bunch of times before it'll tick up by one on my actual LEDs. So remember, it's 50 million. So if I take the count and I just shift it to the right by say, well, if I shift it by 20 bits, that's like dividing it by two to the 20th power, right, which is about a million, right? So if I shift it by 20 bits, that'll effectively divide the counter value by one million. And so it'll tick up once every 50 times per second, once every uh, 20 milliseconds, right? Uh, maybe I should go a little more aggressive with that. I'll go 22, that's four million, to the 22nd power, four million. So that would be incrementing, you know, five times per second or so, right? So let's try that. And uh, that's it, that's all, that's all I need. So. Did I forget something? Okay. okay. All right, so I think we're good to go. Now, I might have to typecast this with this Alt. I might have to put this Alt 64 here, but I'm gonna try it without it. I'm just curious if it'll work. All right, so down in my secondary window, I'm gonna go back to lights.bsp and let's see how many errors I get when I try to build it. Oh, I didn't get any errors. Okay, wow, it actually, oh, it did, did say, uh, there is a warning there though. It says left shift count is greater than the width. Ah, well, there you go. So that answers my question. So it's saying that you're shifting by 32 bits and you only got 32 bits. It, the compiler is seeing this value as 32 bits. We don't want that. We want it to see this as a 64-bit value. So I am gonna go ahead and just typecast that. That'll get rid of that warning. Uh, so Alt U64 and I'll put uh, Alt U64 there. All right, so that should get rid of that warning. And, um, okay, make, it's good to go. If you look at lights.elf, it should have the, uh, it should be February 14th, 249, so that's good. So let's give it a shot. Neos2, download lights.elf. Let's see if it works. So downloading it. Okay, it is not working. <laughs> it's not doing, oh, there it goes. There it is. Just took a little longer to get started. So you can see that it's counting up now by one uh, uh, 200 milliseconds or so. Every 200 milliseconds it counts up and now it's, um, and it's gonna use all 26. Now I had an issue earlier to, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, see there's, once it counts up, once it gets to bit eight, it, it rolls over to the red LEDs, right? It's because we got the green here and the red here. Okay, any questions about that? Yes? Um, just for our um, FPGA, the red does not work when we did that with ours, but we haven't really looked at it since then. Okay, you want to double, there's a few things you want to double check then. You want to make sure that you've got, because there's several things that could cause that. Mm -hmm. 
One thing is uh, in Cordis, you got to make sure you've got the red. Well, first of all, you have to have an output for the, I don't know how well you can read that, but there's an output here for LED R and you have to have an output port for it on your top level design. You also have to actually connect to it internally inside your design. And the way I did it was the LEDs export, which is the port on the SOB uh, platform designer design, uh, I connected to LED R and G. Now I haven't shown this to you guys yet, but this is a system Verilog thing where if you use curly braces, you can concatenate two signals even if you're, even if they're, you're writing to them, right? You can concatenate two signals even if they're the basically an, effectively on the left hand side of an assignment, which is what's happening here. You guys, what I mean by that is this LEDs export is an output. That's how I had it set up. So this is outputting, and I'm outputting simultaneously to two signals in a way that where they're concatenated, and because there's only I, I could have also created a separate LED G and LED R outputs from SOPC Builder, or I could have had each bit individually set up as a PIO too. Does that make sense? Uh, so you want to check that. You also want to check um, your uh, your code. Uh, let's see, your um, your C code. Um, uh, make sure there's nothing strange in there. Um, and the, of course, there's the SOPC builder, or the uh, platform designer, sorry. Uh, the LEDs, make sure you're, you've got the clock there. Um, actually, though, if it wasn't clocked, you wouldn't get any LEDs, right? It wouldn't just be the red ones. So, um, um, oh, oh, I know what it could be. Actually, I just thought of this. If you double click on that, that parallel I.O., which I called LEDs, the default value, I think, is eight. So if you didn't change that, then that would, that would because there just happens to be eight green LEDs. So that might have been. Okay, yeah, so I, I changed that to 26. Okay, no problem. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, so you can also, you can also debug your code on the board. Um, I won't go through that, uh, but you know, I, I've showed some. If you guys have questions about that, let me know. We can sit down and help you with that in the lab. There's also instructions on how to set up debugging in the lab sheet. Okay? And when I say debugging, I mean software debugging, like you can step through each line of code as it runs on the CPU. You can also do stuff, well actually, you know what, hold on, I bet I could really quickly show you that, uh, something that's kind of cool about that. If I go to terminal, okay, so, where's my other terminal? Okay, so um, if I type um, neos2 uh, uh, gdb server dash dash tcp port 8888, dash dash TCP persist, like that. And, uh, and then over here, I can type neos2 dash uh, GDB, uh, sorry, no, elf GDB, um, GDB, GDB lights.elf, and then um, target remote local host 8888. That should connect. Okay, now, um, Oh, yep, you're right, I did. Thank you. Lights, target, remote, local host. Okay, okay. so yeah, so now, um, once I connected to the debugger, it froze the program at that line of code, okay? But the neat thing about this is that um, if you, once you connect to the debugger, you can read and write anything in the, in the space, in the memory space that the NEOS has access to, including the LEDs and performance counter and stuff like that. So, for example, like say I want, like if I, if I say set, and then um, I go back to um, my BSP, lights BSP, and I look at um, uh, system.h, and I look for the LED. Okay, the LED base is right here. It's 10001040. Now I mentioned that you shouldn't use those numbers in your code, but in the debugger, it might be useful to, um, you know, to, uh, to do something like this, where you can just set values. So I can like, I, I can set like that, that, that star is a dereference. Hopefully you guys covered that in, in um, 
240. So the star is a dereference. So the star means I want to set the location uh, that, uh, at memory address 1001040 to 12. So then I could say, um, I don't know, FF00FF. -F. So that should put uh, eight ones, eight zeros, and then eight ones on there. See? And then I get, yeah, eight ones, eight zeros, eight ones, right? So I can directly manipulate stuff through the debugger to the board, of course, and I could read the performance counter if I wanted to as well with that, uh, except instead of set, you would just use print, right, the print command. Okay, any questions? Okay, great.